welcome you all to this course on uh, electron diffraction and imaging. In the next few classes, we will talk about some of the new techniques which has uh, evolved in electron microscopy. In fact, a lot of new techniques have evolved, but some of them are being used most extensively in the present times and I will be uh, talking about some of these techniques. Okay. Before we go into what all the new techniques, to understand what all types of techniques which we can have, the first thing which we should know is what is the way in which the probe interacts with matter. Okay. Uh, this I had mentioned earlier, but just for the sake of completeness, I am repeating it again here. Okay. Suppose primary beam, the incident beam is essentially electrons. Okay. When the electron falls onto the sample, there are various ways in which the electron can interact with the material. One, the electron can be scattered back which are called as elastically scattered back, they are called as backscattered electrons. When secondary electrons could be emitted from the sample surface where the electron beam is falling. Then characteristic x-rays could come out from the sample surface. All these signals which are coming out of an electron beam falling onto the sample, it is used in SEM scanning electron microscope to get image of the sample surface as well as uh, chemical composition of that element. Okay. And in addition to it some of the backscattered electrons they give rise to uh, uh, diffraction. Okay. This could be used as a technique called EBSD to get information about the crystallographic information about the orientation of the various grains all these things. This you might have studied in the course on uh, scanning electron microscope. Okay. If the sample is really thin, then what is going to happen is that most of the primary electrons will pass through the sample okay, and uh, most of them will come out without losing any energy. That means that whatever the interaction which takes place with the matter is essentially an elastic scattering. These electrons which are coming almost in the incident direction, these are all the transmitted electrons, these are all the ones which are used to get. Uh, used to form okay, uh, bright field or dark field images which you have talked about uh, in the earlier classes. Okay. Then conventional diffraction pattern we can obtain from that sample. Okay. In addition to it, okay, some of the electrons are inelastically scattered. What is inelastic scattering? It is nothing but uh, the electron loses part of its energy. That is when the primary electron beam interacts with an atom, instead of elastic scattering, the part of its energy could be used to knock out an electron from a core level. When an electron from a core level is knocked out okay, and then the electron which uh, comes out okay, has lost some definite amount of energy, measuring this energy Okay. We can get information about the uh, type of element which is present and the chem chemical state in which the element is present, all this information which could be obtained. Okay. And uh, this inelastically scattered electrons is uh, used to get information about this uh, uh, sample composition. This is called as electron energy loss spectroscopy and in fact this is also used to generate a microscope called energy filtered. Uh, transmission electron microscope which we will be talking about it a uh, little bit later. Okay. Uh, in addition to this, the electrons could be elastically scattered. Okay. This elastically scattered electron could be scattered uh, normally as uh, we have discussed earlier okay. during conventional uh, diffraction is a process of uh, uh, elastic scattering of a coherent beam. Okay. But in that case, the Bragg angle is less than 1 degree. Here, when the bra uh, angle of scattering becomes uh, more than 3 degree or 5 to 9 degrees, okay, in those regions, it is essentially an incoherent beam, okay, but it is elastically scattered. This also gives rise to some information. This, is called as the, this type of scattering is called as the Rutherford scattering and this is used to get information about the distribution of elements on the sample surface at atomic resolution. Okay. We will be talking about this technique as well today. These, uh, so, what we will be talking about then, 
So far what we considered is that primary beam is essentially a stationary beam. Suppose the primary beam can be made to move scan on that sample surface. So we have a sample, okay. the primary beam is scanned, being scanned like this over a small region of that sample surface. Every region or every point when the electron passes through the sample and comes out of it, all these signals are obtained. So in fact, we can find out distribution of various elements okay, along columns uh, uh, where the electron beam is passing through the columns on that sample. Okay. This is what is called as, uh, uh, this when we operate it in a reflection mode, which we call it as a scanning electron microscope, when we operate it in a transmission mode, we call it as a scanning transmission electron microscopy. Before we go further, let us just uh, mm, uh, recap okay, uh, what we have studied in the conventional uh, diffraction technique before we go to scanning transmission. Okay. In a conventional diffraction technique, essentially as the beam passes through the sample, if it is a crystalline specimen, in that case the contrast is arising mainly because of diffraction because depending upon the defects which are present and how they are displaced from the original position the intensity of the scattered radiation will change. That will bring about a variation in intensity of both the diffracted region as well as the transmitted region and this intensity is used to appears in the form of a contrast in the image. That is how we are able to form an image. Okay. If you form an image using the transmitted beam, we call it as a bright field microscope. Okay. If we use the any diffracted beam to form an image when we call it as a dark field uh, microscopy. In addition to that, uh, if the diffraction pattern from the uh, each of the from the sample where the electron beam is falling, we can get it. Okay, that gives information about the crystal structure. This is what we have studied uh, earlier. But what are uh, the advantages and disadvantages of it? We'll just talk about it a little. Okay, how it is in a bright field, it is done. This is what is shown schematically here. Okay the electron beam, parallel beam of electrons passes through the sample, all the transmitted beam are focused to a point at the back focal plane and the diffracted beam are focused to a particular point. Okay. We assume uh, that the sample is a single crystal. Okay. If we put an aperture around it okay, in the back focal plane so that only the transmitted beam used to uh, form an image then we call it as a bright field image. So essentially when we put an aperture, this will be only this region will be there, all the other diffraction parts will be covered. The dark field image what we do is essentially uh, we put an aperture around the diffraction spot okay, and then we can form a dark field image. But in this sort of a dark field image, the problem which essentially happens is that this beam is away from the optic axis. We know that uh, when we use lens system to magnify any ray which is away from the optic axis, the lens aberrations becomes quite large because of which the resolution becomes very poor. To overcome this, what we do is that if we can tilt that sample so that the transmitted beam is uh, making an angle with respect to a sample, okay, with respect to a diffracting plane and the diffracted beam is along that optic axis. This is normally called as a centered dark field technique. This is the technique which is normally employed in an electron microscope. This technique when we use, what is a problem which are going that only one diffraction spot which we are using it. This means that the beam which is uh, diffracted in a only a particular direction only that we are using. So that region only will be, we will be able to see in the dark field image. Okay. Here an example which I am showing is in a polycrystalline material which contains a large number of fine grains, a diffraction pattern has been taken. One can see that uh, this is the transmitted uh, region, transmitted spot and the diffracted spot if you look at it, there are many fine spots could be seen but overall it appears that this is like a circular pattern. That means that nearly all the random orientations of the grains are there. Suppose I put an aperture around this particular spot, okay. this may correspond to possibly this particular grain from which this diffraction spot has emerged. Okay. 
then only that will give rise to a uh, will be image uh, as bright in the dark field picture. All other grains if you have to image what we have to do we have to put an aperture around here or here or here or here like this around each of these parts uh, this diffractors parts we have to put an aperture then only we will be able to image all other grains or if it is uh, some precipitates which are there those precipitates can be imaged uh, only that way. That means that this takes an unusually long time and a lot of images have to be uh, micrographs have to be uh, generated to get complete information about the orientation of the various grains. This is one typical example one can think of uh, many other examples. Here is an another example which I had given this is also from a single crystal where one can see that using an aperture around either this reflection or this diffraction reflection we can image the type of precipitates which are there. In an another grain they may be oriented in a different way the whole diffraction pattern might have shifted then this part would have shifted to some other position and when this shift like this that can finally give rise to a sort of a circle when all random orientations are there this is what. So, what is the other way in which we can increase the uh, speed of observation or the uh, speed of uh, recording of the images. This is done using a technique which is called as a hollow cone technique. If you remember here what we have done is we have taken only uh, this diffraction uh, pattern is essentially coming because beam is tilted like this ok. So, this is what it is coming ok. Suppose many other orientations are there of the grains which are going to be there under sample. If I rotate the beam taking it in this direction around this axis if I rotate this beam essentially what will happen is that the transmitted beam around the cone making an angle theta all the possible orientations it is being rotated ok. But the diffractors part from all those ones will be coming along this direction ok that is they are all passing through the center. This is exactly what is being done in the case of hollow cone dark field imaging that is uh, for a particular Bragg angle ok we want a specific uh, diffraction spot to come at the center ok passing that is mean passing through the optic axis the incident beam we just tilt it and rotate it around it. Then what is going to happen is that the all the transmitted spot corresponding to all of them ok as we scan it around they are coming. So, now if you look at the diffraction pattern uh, if you look at the uh, dark field image now we can see that the so many grains are getting lighted up. This is a case which I mentioned earlier where we put an aperture around a particular spot only one or two grains are getting imaged. In this particular case from the same bright field region ok when we do a hollow cone imaging. So, we can control the scanning uh, uh, speed and uh, uh, what is the rate at which we are recording and all these things could be done. So, that in one micrograph we can have that uh, uh, images of various grains ok which are uh, oriented for a particular diffraction they could all be imaged simultaneous ok. This is one technique uh, for which some uh, changes are required because essentially a scanning coil is required. This could be done in a microscope which has got what is called as a scanning transmission type of an electron microscope it could be done ok. Now, let us go to what is scanning transmission electron microscope ok. Normally in an electron microscope what we do the uh, condenser lens makes a parallel beam and the parallel beam is falling onto the sample surface correct. And when it falls onto the sample surface the diffraction is taking place the contrast variation comes because of the different types of uh, elements which are present and that gives rise to uh, uh, mass uh, uh, absorption contrast 
and in addition if it is a crystalline material the diffraction phenomena also will be taking place and the extent of uh, scattering will change depending upon uh, how well the planes are oriented for scattering. So, that is how we form an image. So, but it is a stationary beam ok. Suppose uh, we wanted to use it as a scanning and transmission electron microscope what we have to do it is make the beam as fine as possible ok. What is essentially being done is using some deflection coils ok. Essentially the beam is being made into a fine parallel beam and one additional lens which has been added in the condenser lens this lens makes this convergent beam ok. Using this uh, scanning coils we can scan the beam across that sample surface like as I had mentioned here we can scan that sample sir ok. So, from uh, then what we can do it is we can put a detector ok below that sample ok. We can have a detector uh, and with as the beam passes through the sample what is going to hap happen? Uh, let us look at it ok. At every point if the sample is a crystalline sample the when the beam falls onto this one that is a transmitted beam it is a beam which is converged the way we converge it so that we can have a very fine beam which is possible. In fact one should uh, remember that this sort of microscopy is possible ok uh, and we can get good results because of uh, field emission gun which is available nowadays as a standard one in almost all the electron microscopes ok because the field emission gun gives very good brightness and because of that over a very small region we can be have very high intensity of the uh, beam ok. Coming back to that this one. So, as the beam is being scanned on that sample surface this point uh, as the the uh, the convergent beam is falling onto it this is the transmitted beam which comes ok. Then the diffracted beam will be coming like this similarly from this point also the transmitted beam and the different beam assuming that this is a single crystal then this is the transmitted beam and this is the different. What is essentially important in all these cases when we scan the beam on the sample surface the beam has to be uh, the direction of the beam has to be parallel to the optic axis so that the aberrations are uh, minimum ok. And then the all the diffracted beams that is the lens what it does it that objective lens ok this focuses all of them to one particular point ok irrespective of where the beam is hitting like if you remember when a parallel beam also which we are using it uh, which is uh, having a large size of the beam which is falling on the sample all the beam which are parallel to the optic axis they are focused to a point. Similarly in this case also all the beams which are parallel to the optic axis they are all focused to a point. So, we get a, uh, a stationary spot in the diffraction pattern ok this is the transmitted spot and all the diffracted uh, uh, that is diffraction which is taking place in a particular direction from all the region they are also focused to a specific point ok we get a stationary diffraction uh, so uh, spot which we could observe. The way in which we could do it is that we can collect a large number of diffraction parts when the beam is falling at every point so that from every point we get a diffraction pattern corresponding to that or when the beam is scanning on that sample surface we can scan it over a large area and uh, we can do a time average of it so that the diffraction pattern from the whole of the region could also be obtained. Okay. This can be uh, we can use a conventional CCD cameras nowadays very good CCD cameras are there which with which uh, which have very good dynamic range. So, that uh, diffraction patterns could be recorded very easily ok. This is the way we can get the diffraction pattern. In fact, what we should uh, remember is that when this sort of uh, microscope is being used ok essentially we are scanning the beam on every region of that sample ok and as the beam is being scanned we can put detector here 
and the size of the detector and the angle of uh, convergence is used in such a way that all the transmitted beam is collected here okay. and then we can have a detector which is away from it where all the diffracted beams are being collected. So, from every point okay, depending upon the characteristics of the sample okay, we find that intensity of the diffracted beam or transmitted beam will be changing. Okay. So, this is being uh, uh, the, the data is being collected by this detector which has been put just below this sample. So, if we allow this uh, information okay, to what we do is on a TV screen okay, to the uh, grid of the TV screen if we give this uh, the, info, the current which has been collected. Okay. Then what is essentially is going to happen is that there will be a variation in intensity which will be taking place okay. and this will give rise to a contrast on the screen. So, like essentially the same scanning coil is used to control okay, the scanning of the electron beam on the sample surface as well as the scanning on the uh, uh, display screen or the TV screen which we are using it. So, there will be a one to one correspondence between, but what is essentially how do we get that magnification here because a small area which we are scanning it and that is being projected as a large area okay, on the TV screen. So, the TV screen area is fixed suppose we assume that it is a 10 centimeter by uh, 10 centimeter is the area of the TV screen and if we are scanning an area which is essentially about uh, 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter on the sample surface then the magnification turns out to be 10. So, so what we are essentially doing it is the area which we are scanning in the, on the sample surface we can make it smaller and smaller okay, so that we get higher and higher magnification. Another important thing which we should understand is that in this sort of uh, image formation once the beam has passed through the sample we have not uh, used any lenses to form an image so that the lens aberrations are not the one which is going to limit the uh, image quality okay, or the resolution of that image. Here what is essentially important is that the beam which is falling onto the sample okay, that can have some aberrations which are there that will be reflected in the image. And so, what it should be done is that the probe itself you have some characters are there to correct for astigmatism of the probe. Uh, similarly, the spherical aberration of the probe all these things have to be corrected so that we can get an image. This is the greatest advantage because in a transmission electron microscope the as we have uh, studied earlier uh, because of the lens aberrations for a point object we do not get a point image. Here what is happening is that the resolution essentially is determined by the spatial resolution that means that what is the probe size which we use that determines what is going to be the resolution just like in the case of an SEM. Okay. Then if we collect the information which is coming okay, from every region into the annular uh, uh, dark field detector if we use it then what is going to happen is that we will be able to form a dark field image of the uh, sample. Okay. And in fact what I am showing it here is essentially we are talking so far we have discussed everything with respect to a uh, transmitted one uh, beam. So, scanning transmission microscope in fact in the scanning transmission microscope there are the reflected electrons are also going to come secondary electrons are also going to come. We can have a detector uh, for both backscattered electrons as well as secondary electrons and then we can form image like in a conventional SEM the images of the sample could be formed and this is one such image of a magnetic tape which has been taken in a scanning transmission mode in the secondary electron image. You can see that there is a 2 nanometer resolution here in that it is taken of a gold nanoparticle which is a 7 nanometer resolution, but one can see that the uh, contrast here if you look at it is uh, definitely poor, uh, poor 
okay, compared to what you would expect the transmission mode. Okay. So, so far we have discussed about how we can form a, an image of a sample in a scanning transmission mode. So, in this also the principle which we are using is a diffraction which is being taken into account, but the probe is being made into that is the beam is being scanned and the size of the beam is being made as small as possible. So, this is an another schematic view of only the beam which is a convergent beam which is falling on the sample surface. We have a detector which is there. So, essentially what we do a detector is we have a annular detector which is going to be there. Okay. This is the dark field detector. Okay. This detector is the bright field detector. This is annular dark field detector detector. Okay. So, the all the signal which are falling on to uh, this detector is collected to form the bright field image. So, another advantage which here is that when we look at it the, the diffracted beam which is scattered into this annular detector. Okay. All of them are collected together simultaneously and because of that compared to uh, conventional diffraction pattern okay, we could get in the dark field a much better contrast. Here we are just showing an example okay, where gold islands on carbon filling. You can see that uh, this is the bright field picture okay, of that sample where it is being uh, the signal is being collected uh, using the bright field detector. Okay and the unlar dark field detector is used to collect uh, the diffraction uh, that collect the dark field image uh, using the beam which is diffracted onto this region. So, because of uh, this almost all the particles which are scattering into the this particular cone okay, which reach the dark field detector all those particles get uh, image simultaneously. Okay. This is a typical diffraction pattern which is taken from this sort of a particle okay, which is a circular ring pattern which I had mentioned earlier how it is to be taken. Okay. So, here what I am just showing it is that a comparison between TEM conventional transmission electron microscope in the bright field and dark field imaging what we are doing it essentially is that in this particular case we put an aperture. So, like in this case when we take a bright field image in a conventional uh, transmission electron microscope, the contrast which arises is due to diffraction which has taken place uh, from the same region okay, in different directions. Okay. That is what it gives. But when we come to the dark field image, we are using only a specific diffraction spot because of which we find that the intensity of the uh, dark field image could be very small whereas, in the case of a scanning transmission operation okay, the dark field image uh, it collects diffraction oriented uh, uh, making a particular angle okay, uh, a particular solid angle is always collected and because of which the contrast is much better. Okay. In this particular one what I am just uh, trying to show essentially an image which has been taken using a, a, a scanning transmission electron microscopy as well as uh, the conventional transmission electron microscopy. What one should understand that micros the present day microscopes in the same microscope we can operate it like if you remember we have talked about earlier a convergent beam diffraction. Okay. In that convergent beam diffraction technique we can converge the beam and if you a scanning coil is attached if you activate that we can operate it in a scanning transmission mode. Okay. And if we uh, switch off the scanner uh, scanning coils 
and make the stationary beam fall on that sample and activate all other lenses below the uh, objective lens, then we can operate it as a conventional uh, uh, tran uh, uh, transmission electron uh, microscope. Okay. Uh, image of a sample from the same region is being shown which is taken uh, in bright field both in a, this is in a conventional uh, transmission electron microscope and this is uh, in a uh, scanning transmission mode. What one can see very clearly is that here in the bright field picture the contrast one could see very clearly. Okay. But at the same time we can see all the bent contours all of them give rise to a contrast okay, which is masking the features which are uh, to be seen like here because of uh, the contrast we are not able to see it. Whereas this bent contour since we are uh, uh, scanning the beam onto the sample surface okay, and uh, these secondary effects like uh, bent contours uh, contributing to uh, scattering, they do not uh, occur in the case of uh, uh, scanning transmission electron microscope and because of that we can see the features much more clearly free from all the bent contours and other effects. This is one important advantage in using a scanning transmission electron microscope. Okay. So, here what I had uh, just showing it is that suppose we make the beam as fine as possible maybe of the order of about 0 0.1 my, uh, nanometer then what is it going to happen such a fine beam we can almost probe column of uh, 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 atoms on uh, along the beam direction could be probed very easily in a scanning uh, transmission electron microscope. Okay. So, whatever is the contrast which we are getting it bright field or the dark field contrast arises essentially from each region uh, the type of atoms which are there how much they contribute to it. Okay, because we have made the beam almost as fine as possible. So, essentially scattering from each of the individual atoms is going to determine what is the sort of a contrast which we are going to get. Okay. In this particular schematic what essentially is being shown is that what is the angle of convergence uh, or the angle of divergence over which that we collect the uh, signal. That is if we collect that signal over an angle which is between 10 millirads to 50 millirads okay, scattered in that direction this generally gives rise to a conventional uh, dark field image. Okay. And if we collect signals over a angle which is uh, much larger than that that is between 10 to 50 millirads that is uh, it is about something like uh, uh, maybe 3 degrees to uh, about 3 degrees to 5 degrees. Okay. This is called as high angle annular dark field imaging or this is called as the Z contrast imaging which we will come to shortly and try to understand it. Okay. And uh, it is only a very small angle over which because angle less than uh, 10 millirads is over which the bright field detector is collecting the information. Here uh, what is being shown is the image of a sample which is essentially a platinum uh, catalyst okay, on the surface of an alumina. Okay. The platinums are very fine uh, uh, platinum atoms which are sticking onto the surface of. Uh, here what is essentially is being done is that as I mentioned if you have a sample like this okay, these are all the rows over which you assume that this you can kind of plane over which we have uh, columns of atoms are there. If the beam a converged beam is falling onto this column it will be interacting with the atom okay. then it scatters into the different directions some scattering and some are getting scattered into it. 
If you remember earlier, I mentioned when we talked about atomic scattering factor, okay. In the case of an electron, okay, the interaction of uh, primary beam with the sample, okay, it interacts with the nucleus as well as the electron surrounding it, okay. That means that if you look at the atomic scattering factor, there is a term which contains due to the uh, nuclear scattering. This scattering we called as an incoherent scattering when that angle is very large, okay. Uh, it is incoherent, but the scattering is an elastic scattering. And here we can see that f of uh, theta, that is the atomic scattering factor from each of the atom, the contribution to the scattered beam is proportional to uh, uh, Z or in the intensity it will be proportional to Z squared. This factor is essentially comes from the elastic scattering which con contributes to a normal diffraction, okay. And especially angles greater than theta, this Rutherford scattering is the one which predominates and the angles which are smaller than theta where the diffraction is what is going to be predominant. So, annular detector which we are using it, okay, they can collect uh, uh, the information which is being collected as the beam is being made very fine is depending upon the type of atoms which are going to be present, okay, the contrast will be uh, changing because atomic scattering factor is changing as we have seen just now. Because of that, what is going to happen is that in the image when we form different regions will show different contrast. Here the platinum is a high third one compared to alumina. So, it appears as a bright particle, okay. That is what we are seeing. This is called as the C contrast, okay. And with this, earlier this was uh, done using annular dark field. So, that, but in annular dark field both this uh, uh, Rutherford scattering as well as the conventional diffraction both of them could play. Essentially what determines is the size of the probe. Earlier the probe size was uh, rather uh, large uh, only with the advent of uh, as I mentioned the field emission gun. We could get uh, uh, probes which are very fine and probe columns of atom, okay. So, high angle scattering that is what I had just listed here. High angle scattering is a Rutherford scattering and this is an incoherent scattering and uh, this is free from the phase relationship which we consider for diffraction and this also called uh, the Z contrast and the atomic scattering uh, that is the cross section for scattering if you take it, this is proportional to uh, F squared. So, it is good to Z squared. So, the intensity if you look at it will be the number of particles which are going to be there. Okay. Another example which I have taken is a uh, silicon sample on which bismuth has been uh, implanted into it. This is a, a bright field picture. In this bright field picture we can see the defects which are being present on them. They are getting imaged here. But in this region if you look at it, here there is a very slight variation in contrast is going to be there, okay. But this is the dark field which has been taken from here. Now we can make out that in this region as well as this one there is a uh, increase in brightness is there, okay. This is where the bismuth has finally come and settled on the sample surface, okay. The contrast which arises can be related using this formula where sigma A by sigma B minus F B into C B, where C B is the concentration of the dopant and F B is the fraction of dopant substituting uh, in the matrix atom position. Sigma A and sigma B is that scat uh, Rutherford scattering uh, uh, cross section for uh, matrix atoms as well as for the uh, dopant respectively. Okay. Using this we can find out how much a contrast is going to be there. This is essentially a rose uh, resolution picture, okay. This we have already uh, discussed, okay. Now let us come to the case where the beam size as I mentioned can be made as fine as possible, okay. Here what I have taken is a, a silicon sample, 
okay, which is along 110 direction. Okay. The advantage here is that this is a multi layer of a sample which has been chosen. Okay. Uh, the multi layer which contains uh, germanium, then silicon, germanium, silicon, germanium, silicon. We know that the germ with some specific thickness of both of them. We know that uh, both of them are iso uh, structural okay. the, and in this when we try to do a Z contrast imaging that is here the imaging is done using what is called as uh, high angle annular dark field image. Okay. Uh, in this particular image if you look at it because here the contrast from conventional diffraction is also there, here that is reduced considerably. So, most of the contrast is coming essentially from the uh, elements which are present at different sizes uh, at different positions. Okay. So, now one can make out that germanium has got an atomic number higher compared to that of a silicon. So, the contrast from germanium atoms okay, the scattering should be more. So, uh, since the beam size is very fine okay, as we make the beam pass through this like this and the beam as is passing through the center the intensity will be more here and as it passes through this depending upon the amount of scattering which is going to happen okay, the intensity will be less in the transmitted beam. But in the dark field if an heavy atom is going to be there. This will give rise to the large scattered angle. Okay. The intensity of the scattered beam is essentially proportional to Z square. Okay. Whereas, from an atom which is going to be there or from this region, the intensity is going to be again proportional to Z square, but suppose it is a low Z element, this will be a poor uh, that is the neighboring region will have a poor contrast compared to this region where it will be high. Okay. In fact, from this explanation if we can make the beam very fine we should be able to probe and get information about atoms along a specific column or even a single atom identification should be possible. This we will talk in the next class. Okay. Here what we can make out is that depending upon the elements which are present at different regions. Okay, the Z contrast, the intensity of the contrast from those region is going to be uh, large because of that both silicon as well as the germanium we can see that high resolution pictures which we could get it okay. because we are probing row of uh, atoms that is what essentially is being shown here this is a row of atoms which are being shown projected along the desired direction. Okay. This is how that object function means that how the desert is going to change in these regions. Okay. In the image depending upon what the beam size is whether if it is able to resolve it, it will resolve it. In this case it is not able to resolve, but still we can see that this appears as a uh, slight increase. Okay. We can immediately make out that the regions which contain germanium the contrast is high the regions which contain silicon if you look carefully the contrast is uh, uh, poor. I have just taken an another example where it becomes much clear. Okay. You look at this case, this is again silicon germanium sample with a silicon oxide on the top of that sample. This is a normal high resolution picture which has been taken. If you look at this picture we cannot make out whether which region contains silicon which region contains germanium. Okay. We have uh, studied about how to form a high resolution picture, uh, 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 do a high resolution transmission electron microscopy uh, earlier okay. and this is from the same region we are now doing a scanning um, uh, transmission that is a C contrast uh, microscopy. So, since the beam size is being made as fine as possible that is of the order of the atomic size because of that we can get an atomic resolution uh, image of the sample could be obtained. That is one thing which we should understand that this is also from a uh, strontium titanate 
we could get an atomic resolution pictures because earlier we studied that essentially the phase contrast we use it to get an atomic resolution pictures. But making the beam smaller than the inter particle uh, uh, inter atomic distance okay, and probing on, uh, on that sample surface we can generate atomic resolution pictures could be generated. And what is the advantage? Here we are not able to differentiate between silicon and germanium. Here we can make out that the silicon, the contrast or the intensity of uh, each of the dots is uh, uh, very poor whereas the intensity is high in the region which contains germanium. This way we can distinguish that these two regions belong to different type of elements. Okay. In this particular case the strontium titanium here one can immediately make out that the region which contains that strontium these are all the regions which has got a, this is looking at some along a boundary okay. and this is the region which corresponds to uh, like here which is being shown both titanium and oxygen atoms are there because strontium has a high atomic number. So, the in uh, uh, brightness is high here, here it is less when that oxygen atoms are going to be there it is very difficult to make out but it is a very faint contrast is there. So, this way essentially true atomic uh, uh, resolution uh, images could be obtained using C contrast imaging. So, almost all the atoms which could be done, but this looks uh, very simple, but what essentially is being done in a microscope is that uh, there are some uh, computations also models also have to be done one has to calculate it, but it is still possible to identify the various types of elements which are present and uh, where they are present on the atom side those information also could be used uh, those information also we could obtain in a uh, C contrast imaging. The C contrast imaging is called by an another name that is he said that C contrast microscopy or high angle and large dark field uh, imaging. So, both the names are being used, but irrespective of it to get atomic resolution pictures what is essentially important is that the probe should be made into a fine probe of the order of that atomic radius and the aberrations correction of all the aberrations and alignment of the beam along the uh, perfectly along the optic axis is the one which is important to get this sort of measures that part of it I am not going into a details which you can see in many books which are available in the literature. This is an another example where as I mentioned the silicon in silicon antimony has been uh, 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 diffused into it okay. In this picture we can make out that silicon atom positions and this bright spots which we are seeing are the positions which contain antimony atoms okay. So, that way we can identify where the elements have gone and sitting on that sample that identification is possible. In most of these cases the one thing which one has to always remember is that if the sample is slightly thick the beam as it enters when it interacts with it the beam size will become large. So, if that should not happen that at atomic resolution pictures which we have to get it the beam has to the sample thickness has to be as small as possible. Most of the time these images are taken from samples where the sample thickness may be of the order of uh, uh, 5 nanometers 5 to 6 nanometers or less. Then we can get much better picture also we can precisely find out where exactly the atoms are sitting on the uh, sample surface. Okay. We will stop here now. Okay. In the next class we will talk about electron energy loss spectroscopy. Thank you.